Good morning. Could you guys, you bring the spot down a little bit. I know it changes the color of my shirt when we go on line, but I just like to see people. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> we are, uh, I did a wedding yesterday. Uh, the, the Bauman and Kemperman and Variki family, they, many of them usually sit right up there. I wrote them a hall pass because they were going to be out late last night that they can just join online. Um, uh, the only reason I tell you that is because I don't know when it happens, but there's a day when everybody just wants to remind you of your age. So Ellie, who got married yesterday, um, I baptized her when she was a child. And I've done weddings for people that I baptized before, but they kept reminding me. I'm old. Um, and the other reason to let you know that that happened yesterday is because in, in the midst of this message, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to refer to a passage that the couple picked for their wedding ceremony yesterday, and it's one that we all know very, very, very well. So let me tell you where we're headed today. We got to do some more um, summarizing. Uh, we're going to catch up a little bit. Uh, summarizing, we, there's 15 to, 15 to 18 years of David's life that we're, we're getting through in just three months. So there's a lot of reading. There's a lot of stuff going on. And so sometimes we have to summarize so that we can get to a particular passage. And we're going to do that today just with three chapters. So I'm going to get you caught up a little bit. And then we're going to read chapter 30 of 1 Samuel. And next week we'll be in the book of 2 Samuel. We find out about David, or I mean Saul and Jonathan and how they died. It's actually a battle that David gets plucked out of that took them out. So um, let me pray and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get you caught up and then we'll go to, ver or to chapter 30. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this church. Um, I was reminded yesterday of how good we have it here. Um, hearing of other churches that are struggling and or there's conflict, and I'm just so thankful to serve these people. And Lord, just the evidence of, we've had, I think, 21 or 22 funerals since January, or February 29. And then there's other deaths that have taken place where there wasn't a funeral. Um, and to see people's hope when they know they're walking their last days and to see people's hope in Christ when they're grieving the loss of someone that they've loved. And Lord, to see this church respond with cards and prayers and hugs and remembering months later that someone's, someone has lost someone dear to them. It, Lord, these people reflect you well, and I thank you for them. And I ask, Lord, today that you speak to us and that you do something in us so that we reflect you even more, that you show us what you want us to see, that you tell us what you want us to hear, and that we receive what you want to give us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so if you haven't been around much this summer, I know there's vacation, all that kind of stuff. We're, going, we're spending the summer with David, and David, we meet him um, when he's just a boy. Uh, he's a little shepherd boy. He's the least of the sons of Jesse, and he's been bar mitzvahed, uh, which means he's 12 or 13. He's not very old, and we know that he becomes king of Judah uh, when he's 30, and at 32 and a half, he becomes king over all of Israel. So from, let's say, 13 to 30, that's the section that we've been in. Um, and so it's years and years and years. It's not just one chapter and then this happened and then this happened. I mean, even their travel times, uh, we'll read about one today. You know, they, they traveled to go to this battle for three days of walking. They slept one night and then they had to travel three days back because they didn't end up engaging in the battle. Um, so David's growing up. Now, one thing we're going to hear about today in the chapter 30 is, is how God completed what Saul left incomplete. Saul was the king, the first king of, of God's people, and Saul had God's favor. God had anointed him king and, and promised to be with him. But then Saul, there was a time when Saul was to attack the Amalekites, and the Amalekites are kind of barbaric. And um, Saul disobeyed God. God said, and I don't like it. But God said, I want you to take them, all of them out, everybody. And Saul kept some of the plunder back. And when he was confronted by Samuel, he said, uh, well, it was for the Lord. Nope, it wasn't. 
And so God removed his favor, and we've talked about this a lot. God's playing the long game, so he removes favor from Saul, and he starts to raise up David, but David has to become a man with God's character. So he allows Saul's dementia, his dementedness, excuse me, and his paranoia to, to, to develop so that all can see that there's a problem in Saul. David, in the meantime, we see him uh, overreact. We see him um, get his pride hurt. Little by little, though, he's growing into the man God wants him to be as his king. So David started off, he's in Saul's favor, he's a servant to the king, and then he's a commander, but then Saul gets jealous of David, sees him as his rival, and David finds himself in exile. In fact, Saul, three times with his own spear, tried to kill David. And numer innumerable times, God, uh, Saul tried to send his men to kill David. And so David is now living in exile, and on two occasions... David had one-on-one -on -one opportunity with Saul to take his life. In fact, David's men even told him, you got to take him out. You got to take him out. Why didn't you take him out? You should have taken him out. But David is not going to take out someone that God has anointed as king. Plus, David is going to be the man who has restraint. So Saul has lost favor and is getting worse. David is gain, gaining more and more favor and gaining more and more character. Now, David now, because he has to escape Saul, David is living among the Philistines. Now, if you want to know who the Philistines are, Goliath was a Philistine. So just like today, all the nations and people groups surrounding the, the people of God in Israel, they all want them dead, every one of them. And so the Amalekites are like terrorists. The Philistines and the, um, well, the Philistines, they're like, they're barbaric. It's just, it's just, it's just awful. They're always going to war. But David has to get away from Saul. So he and his 600 men um, are living among the Philistines near this city or this town called Ziglag. And there's a local king, kind of a local ruler. His name is Akish. So David and his men become mercenaries, kind of. Akish thinks that they're mercenaries and that they're going. He sends them off to go do something. They go off, they battle, whatever. They bring back the plunder, they give it to Akish. But what, and they didn't have satellites, they didn't have cell phones, they didn't have social media, they didn't have paparazzi, they didn't have all that stuff back then. So David, what he was actually doing is heading into Judah, into Hebron, into um, Bethel, places like that. So when the enemies of God's people were attacking them, David would go and rescue them and attack the enemies as they were trying to attack Judah. And he would take that plunder and bring it back to Achish. So Achish believes that David is a loyal servant now of Achish and the Philistines, but David is actually rescuing God's people, but bringing the spoils back to Achish so that he's keeping in good standing. It's a little duplicitous, but there's a little wisdom in it. And then we find out that the Philistines have decided because they see what's happening with Saul. They see that he's losing his mind. They see that he's lost God's favor. They won't, wouldn't put it that way, but they see that he's vulnerable. So the Philistines, all the different city groups, all the different people, all the different rulers, they all decide that they're going to gather together and go and they're going to kill Saul and take down Israel. Now, David, who's a mercenary, supposedly, for the Philistines, he gets called up and his men to go and battle Israel, his own blood. And as he's getting prepared for this, he finds himself in an impossible situation. Either I fight against my own people, of whom God wants me to be king, and if I do that, I kill my own people, then I lose God's favor and I become like Saul. But if I go into battle with the Philistines and turn on the Philistines, they're going to run me through. So either... Israel is going to run him through, or the Philistines are going to run him through. And so he finds himself in this spot, and God in his providence decides to pluck David and his men out of this situation, because when they get there, Achish is saying, David's loyal, he's awesome, we want them in battle with us. And the other commanders are like, he's the one that they said he's killed his tens of thousands, he's going to turn on us, he can't. So they forbid David going into battle. So Achish, the king that David knows best, he comes to David and says, I'm sorry, you can't go. And David says this, how is it that I'm not, or can I not fight for my king? Now, we don't know if he means Achish or if he means Saul. It's a little wonky there with the language. But um, Achish tells David, get up early tomorrow morning, 
head back to Ziglag. So David doesn't end up in this impossible situation. He has no way to make a right decision there because both of them are wrong in some way. And that brings us to chapter 30. David and his men, after traveling for three days to get there, they stay overnight, they pick, pack up, and they travel three days back home to be with their wives and children. David and his men reached Zik- Ziklag on the third day. Now, the Amalekites had raided the Negev of Ziklag, the Negev and Ziklag. Negev just means wilderness. And they attacked Ziklag and burned it and had taken captive the women and all who were in it, both young and old. They killed none of them, but carried them off as they went on their way. When David and his men came to Ziklag, <clears throat> they found it destroyed by fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. David's two wives. Now we'll get, we might find an occasion to get to this polygamy thing in the future. I just want you to know this. God has never blessed or condoned polygamy, but in about a thousand BC, so about around where we are, um, he didn't punish it. So he didn't bless it, but he didn't punish it. So David and his men wept until they had no strength to, 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 to weep. David's two wives had been captured, Ahinoam uh, of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. David was greatly distressed because the men were, ta- were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters, but David found strength in the Lord his God. Now we'll get back to the strength in the Lord his God uh, here in a minute, but um, I want to to try to give you a mindset that these men are in. Why would they turn on David and threaten to stone him? Um, So I'm just going to ask a question of the men for a moment. How do you get when you're frustrated and someone offers advice and or wisdom? Here's an example of my character. A couple years ago, we went through three dishwashers in one year. We had one that didn't work. It wouldn't, when it closed, it wouldn't turn on. So I bought a part. I put it in. It worked. We went on vacation. We came back. Didn't work. So we had to buy a new one. Of course, it was Thanksgiving weekend when we had family in town. Um, but when I was trying to pull that one out, because I don't want to pay for the, uh, well, the delivery was free, but I want to pay for the installation, because it's a dishwasher. I got to saw a dishwasher. So I get ready to pull this thing out. And if you've ever done anything with a dishwasher in a kitchen, sometimes the floor, um, doesn't go all the way under the dishwasher, and those little feet are down there, and the floor is over the feet. And so I'm, I've got this thing, and I'm pulling it apart. My hands are up under there. I got bloody knuckles, a whole thing, and I can't get the dishwasher out. And Lynn goes, can I help? Not now! You know one of those? Uh, is, is it just me? Okay. And, and she, made the, she made the comment, and she was 100% right, but she said, just because you're frustrated doesn't mean you can be nasty to me. Didn't help. Okay, so that's the, when I'm in that kind of a situation, when I'm frustrated, my character isn't usually, how can I care for the other? That's what's going on with these men. They just marched off to battle. And remember the kind of men that God put in David's command. They were, when he went, when he had nothing, he, he got the bread and the sword from the priest and he ran off near Bethlehem. His father and his brothers came up and all the men and all their wives and all their people who were disenfranchised, who were indebted and who just didn't like any kind of government. We know people like that. These are men that you want to go into battle with because they're bloodthirsty and they're tough and they're mean. But when they get the spoils of battle, they're not teetotalers. They're not sitting all the alcohol aside and they're not necessarily behaving all that well to the women that they've captured. They are men that you want to go into battle with, but you do not want marrying your daughters. So these are men that are volatile and they can get angry. So they were marching into battle. They're ready to go. Then they had to turn around and walk back. They're coming back and, and they went off to battle. They didn't go to battle. So they just wandered around for six days for no reason. And now they get back and David, who led us away, led our kids and our wives and our, all of our stuff. Everything that we've worked for is now burned to the ground and we have no hope. And we know what the Amalekites do to our wives and to our daughters in particular. They knew what was going on. And so who you can't, it can't be your fault. It's got to be my leader. So they're like, we're going we're gonna to chuck rocks at him until he's dead. This is, 
he, he's lost God's favor. He's lost our favor. That's it. But then David, it says, and it's not just that he inquired of the Lord. We do find out in a moment that he does. But David, the wording here doesn't happen very often in the Old Testament. He, was, he found strength in the Lord his God. He's talking about a, a personal relationship, that he, when in the worst situation where he, he could just get angry, he could order someone to take out the, the men that are yelling the loudest about stoning David. He could lash out like I do when I have bloody knuckles and I'm trying to work on a dishwasher. He, but no, he goes to the Lord. And the wording in this in Hebrew is such that it's saying that because David, or because God loves David, David actually loves God. Not just, I got to stay in favor so he protects us. God, he has a personal one-on-one -on -one relationship with the God of the universe. And then David said to Abiathar, the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. Now the ephod is a priestly breastplate. We've talked about that before. It's got a couple little things in it when you're inquiring of the God for a yes or no answer. It's kind of like casting lots. Bring me the ephod. And Abiathar brought it to him and, and David inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue this raiding party and will I overtake them? Pursue them, the Lord answered. You will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. David and the 600 men uh, with him came to, base, to the Basor Ravine, where some stayed behind, for 200 men were too exhausted to cross the ravine. But David and 400 men continued the pursuit. They found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David. They gave him water to drink and food to eat. Part of the... Part of the <laughs> This does not sound like reviving food to me. Part of a cake of pressed figs and two cakes of raisins. Just feels kind of sticky. He ate and was revived, for he had not eaten any food or drunk any water for three days and three nights. And David asked him, to whom do you belong? Where do you come from? He said, I am an Egyptian, the slave of an Amalekite. My master abandoned me when I became ill three days ago. We raided the Negev of the Kirathites and the territory belonging to Judah and the Negev of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag. And David asked him, can, I, or can you lead me down to this raiding party? And he answered, swear to me before God that you will not kill me or hand me over to my master, and I will take you down to them. He led David down, and there they were, scattered over the countryside, eating, drinking, and reveling because of the great amount of plunder that they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from Judah. David fought them from dusk until the evening of the next day, and none of them got away except for 400 young men who rode off on camels and fled. David recovered everything the Amalekites had taken, including his two wives. Nothing was missing, young or old, boy or girl, plunder or anything else that they had taken. David brought everything back. He took all the flocks and the herds, and his men drove them ahead of the other livestock, saying, this is David's plunder. And then David came to the 200 men who had been too exhausted to follow him and who were left behind at the Bezor Ravine. And they came out to meet David and the people with them. As David and his men approached, he greeted them. But all the evil men, now these are that, that ragamuffin group of guys that you don't really want marrying your daughter, um, all the evil men and the troublemakers among David's followers said, because they did not go with us, we'll not share with them the plunder that we recovered. However, we'll let them have their wives and their kids back. And David replied, no, my brothers, you must not do this with what the Lord has given us. He has protected us and handed over to us all the forces that came, or the forces that came against us. And then there's an assumed parenthetical phrase, if you behave like this, who will listen to what you say? The share of the man who stayed with supplies is the same as that of him who went down to the battle. All will share alike. David made this a statute an ordinance for Israel from that day to this. When David arrived at Ziklag, he sent some of the plunder to the elders of Judah, who were his friends, saying, here is a present for you from the plunder of the Lord's enemy. And there's a bunch of names here I'm going to read. I've been practicing, but there's always one that's a little tough. He sent, he sent it to those who were in Bethel, Ramoth, Negev, and Jatir, to those of Oroer, Oror, I don't know, Sith, Sith, Sifmoth, Eshtemoa and Rakal, and to those, uh, to those in the towns of, Jer of the Jeremalites and the Kenites, to those in Hormah, 
Borashan, Atach, and Hebron, and to those in all the other places where David and his men had roamed. It's a lot there. But keep in mind that God is turning David into the man he wants him to be. And because of David's fame throughout the next thousand years, David is the man that, that he's the epitome of what it means to be a Jewish man. He just is. And he is the king over the United Kingdom. And not our United Kingdom, in the, not in Europe, but the United, Israel and Judah together. And it's on his throne that Jesus now sits, because Jesus is the, 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 the high priest forever, the prophet forever, and the king forever. So what kind of man is God turning David into? Well, let's look. So this Egyptian slave, let's just picture this for a minute. You've marched for three days to go into battle. You don't go into battle. You march back home three days, and you find out everything you know, everything you love, everything you own, gone. You're going to kill your leader. The leader inquires of the Lord. Let's go get him. So we're going to go at the raiding party. As they're wandering along, some guy who had been so ill that his master left him behind. He's from Egypt, but he's an Amalekite slave. I don't know if, if he's sending out an SOS or if he's ra- waving, ra- waving a white flag, but three days with no water, the guy has no energy. I'm guessing that these men are walking along and they basically trip over this guy. And then they're like, Dude, sorry, you know, we can help you. If you're still alive and we get back, we'll help you. Because that, they're on mission. They're ready to go. They want to go get their wives and their, and every time, every, every pause they make is more God awful things that may happen to their wives and daughters. So, in a situation like that, I think that I would decide, sorry, dude, we'd help you normally, but not today. But David acts like that man is more important than his mission. He stops, and they feed a man who's starving, and they give a man water who hasn't had anything to drink for three days. Only then do they find out that this was a providential moment where God placed that man there, allowed him to be sick, placed him there, and he's in need of mercy, and he's in need of provision. But only after they give him what he needs, and he revives himself, so this is ours most likely, Only then do they find out this guy might be able to help us. Who are you? Where are you from? Well, I'm an Egyptian slave, or I'm I'm from Egypt, and I'm a slave of Amalekite. And then David's like, oh, God's working here. All right, can you lead us there? Yep, just don't kill me. Deal. And they go, and they take on they take on the, the Amalekites. And remember, David has 400 men at this point. They go into battle and they killed everyone except for 400 that got away on camels. So they were outnumbered unthinkably and they fought for over 24 hours before they were able to head back. And then David gets back and the men that were too tired to go into battle with him, they're feeling much better and they come back victorious and they meet him there. And the guys who just had been bloodied, who haven't slept in over a week, they come back and they're like, you don't get anything. You didn't do the work. We pay the players. And David's like, nope. If the Lord gives grace to us, grace is for all of us. Does that sound familiar? So let's look at the men and David on mission. It's their wives and their daughters that they're going to save. And they know what the Amalekites do to their wives and daughters. What they will do to their sons is something different, but what they will do to their wives and daughters. And so they're on their way, and they come across this guy, and they pause the, they, they pause the march to help a man. Does that not sound like Jesus, who's on mission with the, a ruler's daughter who's sick? He says, will you, will you come and heal her? And he's on his way. They're walking through this crowded little town, and a bunch of people are bumping into him. And a woman who's been bleeding for 30 something years, the woman with the issue of blood, she's used up all her money. She's ceremonially and physically unclean. She's not allowed to have any physical contact with another human being for years. She risks her life because if she touches one other person with that issue of blood, they're supposed to stone her to death. She risks her life by crawling through the crowd, reaches up and touches the hem of Jesus' robe. And he stops and he says, who touched me? Well, everybody. No, I felt power leave. So Jesus paused his mission to make sure a woman was treated with dignity and respect. She was healed of her illness, and she was healed back to her community because he pronounced her clean. 
So Jesus, on mission, is willing to be delayed for the other, for another person. We see this even at the wedding in Cana, when Jesus shows up and they're out of wine, and, and Jesus' mom, like moms do, came up and said, hey, they're out of wine, and he goes, I don't like that phrasing, but woman, it's not my time yet, meaning his ministry of miracles was not supposed to begin, and she did what moms do. She didn't listen to him, told the servants to do whatever he tells you, and so he sent them over to this dank, nasty, sediment-type foot washing jars and scoop some water out, take it to the bridegroom. The bridegroom tastes it. And by the time it goes from here to here, it's not only wine, but it's the best wine. Now, Christians love this because it means maybe we can take a little sippy sip now and then. But what I think is, is curious is that Jesus said, it's not yet my time. And he did it anyway. So God, in the, in, in the person of Jesus, was willing to delay, was willing to change his eternal agenda to make sure people in a wedding we're blessed. David pauses to care for a man, even though it might mean unthinkable things are happening to his children and to his wives. And when they, when they find out that God put that man there to help them, they go, they win, they come back. And it feels like he's rewarding the people that did nothing. But isn't that each one of us? Which one of you deserves everlasting life with Christ? Which one of us deserves grace? Well, if grace is getting what you don't deserve, none of us deserve it. And if Jesus came to be first be served, then he came, then he would have come and just, how do I get to the throne most quickly? But that's not what he came to do. He came to serve. He came to to consider the other over himself. In fact, Paul articulates it beautifully when he says, none of us should have any self, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, consider others better than ourselves. Each of us should look not only to our own interests, but also to the interests of others. So David is one of the first men in Israel that begins to show the heart of God toward the other. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 13, I know we, we know it as the, as the love chapter, and we think it's about love between us, and it is, but it's really about God. And we're told that if, we, if, if, I, can, if I can prophesy, if I can do all this, but I don't have love, I, I gain nothing, I am nothing, I'm a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. And then it says this, it says love is patient, love is kind, it doesn't envy, it doesn't boast, it's not proud, it's not rude, it's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But you notice in there the one that we don't always think about. Love is not self-seeking. And you could replace love with God. Through God is patient. God is kind. God isn't envious. He doesn't boast. He's not proud. He's not rude. God is not self-seeking. How about us? When you're at your worst, do you bless others? I don't. That's what God convicted me of this week in working through this passage. That's what, and it was this morning when that idea, oh yeah, I remember the, the dishwasher. And it, what, a, what a silly thing to snap at my wife over, her trying to help. But if I'm frustrated, if I'm self-focused, it is impossible for me to love the other. So I'm going to ask God in the prayer as we end this message to turn our hearts toward the other, to consider others more important than ourselves, to behave toward other people, whether they be your enemies or your spouses or anywhere in between, that when we're in our, when we're in our worst, that our character shows through. Da keep in mind, David, men wanted to kill him, and his wives and children, daughters, unthinkable things are probably happening to him. So he's in his worst state, and he cares for a man who would probably have died without them pausing. They pause their mission to make a man the mission. Are we willing, able, or do we even want to be people that aren't self-seeking, 
but others seeking. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the example of David. Thank you that we get to watch his life and his character develop. And thank you that he somehow, some way, when his men want to kill him, he turns to you and he finds strength. And when they're going off to rescue, they run into a man, they pause and they make him their mission. Only then to find out that you were going to use that man to help them complete their mission. Lord, he is an example. You are the one who really did it. There was not a person that you came in contact with that you didn't love first. You didn't ask to be served. You came to serve. And you want your people to look very much like you. So, Lord, I pray for me and I pray for us that you will give us the ability to, in our worst, still love the other. Lord, convict us if we need convicting. Bless us because we definitely need blessing. But most of all, Lord, help us reflect you well, even when things are difficult. We pray this in the name of Jesus, through the power of your spirit who lives within us, for the glory of God our Father. Amen.